I'm Stephanie Bird Hutchison. I'm beginning my 18th year in this position as the ESOL teaching specialist. Currently, Wichita has about 51,000 students. We're a majority minority district, so fewer than 50% are white. Very diverse, about 94 countries of birth, including the US. We have students from all over the world that have come here. The largest populations of our refugees are coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, and Somalia. And then there are a variety of other countries as well. We've gone from a handful of schools to more than 50 schools now that serve English language learners. And the variety within those buildings is huge. Some of our buildings may have 20 different languages. The degree of diversity and our awareness of that and, and how that impacts what we do in the schools on a daily basis has made a huge shift in the 26 years I've been here. My name is Alicia Thompson. I am the superintendent of the Wichita Public Schools. We have over 100 languages that are spoken in the homes of our students. That gives our students, in our opinion, an advantage over many other school districts around us However, it does create some challenges for us in the area of literacy, having to make sure that those students are on grade level when they leave us is definitely a challenge. The refugee students access our newcomer programs because of the educational background and the additional challenges that they have. We're finding that the refugees are every bit as diverse as any other group. What might be appropriate support for one family from one part of the world might not be appropriate for another family. And there's also the whole issue of trauma, trying to wrap our heads around that and how that's impacting the classroom and how that's impacting the family at home because we need to educate the whole child, not just the part that learns math and reading. Our needs in our classrooms have grown pretty significantly with the influx of our friends from different countries. We have had to increase our professional development for our teachers so that they understand who's sitting in front of them so that we are able to meet their needs. We've had challenges with communicating. When you have over 100 different languages, making sure that we're engaging those families and having the resources to be able to do that. And we're very fortunate to be able to have a special intake center that welcomes them to our school districts and helps them have a smooth transition. Once we determine that they need to be here, they have another language at home, we start working with the parent on that whole enrollment process, getting them entered to the district while we're testing the students for language proficiency in English. And as part of that enrollment process, we actually do an interview and talk with them about the child's background 
Where have they been in school? What grades were they in those different schools? Were there any special concerns? And we note all that down so that that information goes to the school. We also want to make sure that we have opportunities for our families to continue to learn more about the environment in which their children are going to be in and also to help them to be able to connect to other outside agencies for employment purposes and help them to learn a little bit of English so that they can engage further with us. Our district and our schools benefit hugely and we're so thankful to have the opportunity to educate students from other countries. My name is Alan. I'm almost 20 years. I'm senior. I'm graduating in December. I lived here for three years. I was born and raised in Rwanda, but my parents are from Congo. We didn't live in a town, it's just a camp. In my country, we didn't have enough water, so and you have to work a lot. But here, you have water in your house, and it's very good. I didn't have hope if I will be in a peaceful country, if we will have enough food for our whole family, and living in a house that is good for us. Like, our house was built by the tents, and there was like two rooms, and we had to share all of us, and we were eight in our family. My mom and dad they were in the Congo, and then they moved, and there was no peace, and uh, they moved to another camp. It was in the north, and it's Gichumbi, and we lived there the whole life. My name is Dorcas. I'm a senior, and I'm 19 years old. I was born in Congo, but I grew up in South Africa. I speak more than five languages. I've lived here in Wichita for about one and a half years. Uh, when I arrived here at the airport, it was different. I was so happy to see my new house, peace, enjoy. What I like most is like people like they are caring, especially my teachers, and that is what I like most about it. When I was in South Africa, my school was one hour away from home because my father wanted the better education for us. And my parents couldn't afford like paying for two children just to go to school. When we come home, we have to walk. Other South Africans who wait for me out of the school so that they can come and hit me around. And then I will go like to the hospital for two days or so. Sometimes I went home like crying because they called me bad names. They never liked anyone from other countries. I told my mom that I wanted to go back to Congo or something. Yeah. My father said that the reason for him to leave Congo, it was because there was a war. They were killing people and one of my sisters were killed. So. They left to Burundi and never went back to Congo because whenever they go to Congo, they will remember my sister is crying. Here is a safe place in America. Here you are one guy also from Congo. I asked him, since we are here in Wichita, how many times you found people be killed by the street? He said, I never see if in a homeless die to the street. I said, okay. Now I ask him, you be in Soweto, how many people die in Soweto? Because Soweto per day die 50 people to 100 people per day. Something I like here in schools, uh, teachers understand me when I'm asking questions. And here at North, they encourage people and they pick you as a student of the math, and I think that is very good. It encourages people to do better. I have to work hard because I don't speak English very well, so it's very hard to communicate with them. They speak very fast. My 
my name is Osata Kang. I have been working in the district school about 22 years, and I have been in uh, Curtis Medical School about 10 years. And I am a para and helping all the kids who are refugees that don't speak English. The best part about my job is to help the student. It doesn't matter who came from different countries. And it is related to my uh, experience that I was a refugee in Vietnam. At that time, I did not speak Vietnamese language at all. So I am so grateful that I have opportunity to work with the refugees so I can help them to have good education in the United States. Many times the new refugees are struggling with the language. So I told them about my life, about my experiences. In 1975, when the communist regime came into capital in Cambodia, we were kicked out. So I ended up with my grandpa and we lived close to the mountain. And that time my dad, my mom and my siblings were separated by the war. My dad got killed from starvation and I survived for four countries. In 1976, the Vietnamese government announced that they wanted the Vietnamese go back to Vietnam. So uh, my mom, she lied to the communists that we were uh, a Vietnamese. I did not speak Vietnamese language at all. So when we crossed the border uh, line from Cambodia to Vietnam and the Vietnamese family asked me in um, Vietnamese language, I did not understand, so I cried, mommy, mommy, and she said, no, they just want to ask you, uh, are you from uh, uh, Cambodia, are you Vietnamese? But I was frightened, I cried, because I didn't understand Vietnamese language. The Khmer Rouge regime brought us, and we walked into Vietnam, and we carried this one mat, some dishes, and clothes and we walked into Vietnam without having any family or friends at all. I was the one that still speaking French language and remember my, my uh, sister who that time she lived in France. So I tried to write a letter to tell us that now we are in Vietnam. After she received a letter from us, she tried to sponsor us from Vietnam to France. And I end up, my life end up in United States. And I am so grateful to United States. Some teachers, they don't know how to say with the kids because they don't have that type of experience. First, you have to have the bonding with them. Smile with them, say hello with them. When they know you, that you don't scare them, you can talk to them. And usually if they don't know the word, I do my gesture. That's how we do with kids. That's my gift. Because I love kids, I like to have fun with them. I think because we had a lot of training about refugees, we know what to do. But regular teachers, they don't know how to deal with this type of kids. I would tell the teacher that doesn't know the kid yet. The first I said, she or he comes from this country, does not speak English, so please slow down. Don't talk too fast. I wish that other teachers have training about how to understand the kids. Teachers might have difficult times, but our job is to nurture them, to show them we're going to help you. I'm not just teaching eight hours a day. I want the kids to understand that United States has a lot of opportunities to learn and show them that, hey, I was a survivor from the war too. If I can come this far, you can too. I have to show them that. 
that is one of my uh, gifts. What does it mean to teach a child in a way that's respectful of their family background? What does it take to respect the home while trying to help them learn how to navigate in our society and our culture? Any student that comes in new creates a challenge. We have a large military presence in Kansas where students move frequently and that's always a transition that's hard. You couple that with I don't know the language and that just doubles the anxiety and how scary this transition is gonna be and how hard it's gonna be. But again, what we want are for teachers to reach out and say, I'm gonna establish a relationship with you and your family, and I'm gonna be with you every step along this way as we transition you into this scary new world. Acculturation to me is learning how to keep your culture well interacting successfully with other cultures. It's like the salad bowl concept of everything stays independent, but it, it all mingles together and, and enhances each other. Whereas assimilation to me is more of the melting pot where you lose who you are in order to become more like the dominant culture. Not expecting all of these families coming in from all over the world to suddenly look like a family that's been here for five generations like mine. When we see kids starting to shed who they were, then we see a disconnect happening at home, and that creates more social issues for the family, as well as more challenges for the child to find their way and their anchor in the world. We always start saying that, you know, every culture is valuable, you know? So we're all different and we value every culture. I don't celebrate Ramadan, but we want to hear about Ramadan, we want to learn about Ramadan, and same, Christmas comes, we live in America, this is something, you're going to see Christmas trees, why? And we, we talk about that in a very um, natural way, just welcoming everything and everybody, and it's an opportunity to learn. I get a lot of questions about, will they be offended if I do this? And my answer is starting to become, why don't you ask them? Because they'll talk to you and tell you what is and isn't okay. So dealing with the diversity within the population, it's not a one size fits all. And so we need to respect that and know that one of our strengths as a country and as a people is that we do have all of these different backgrounds to draw from. And that makes us stronger. My name is Jacqueline Barber, and I'm a professor of the practice of health and human rights at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. My work as a lawyer has always been focused on human rights. That's why I became a lawyer. I knew from the start that I wanted to do human rights work. But I did a broad spectrum of different types of work. I gradually started specializing in issues to do with immigration and refugee protection, and that's the area then that I really dedicated myself to. And so I've been working in that area for well over 20 years. When I started working in this field, the only group of children we really talked about were refugees or asylum-seeking children. We used to think that any child arriving alone or arriving in a distressing situation was seeking refugee status. But gradually we realized that actually there are many different types of situations. Some children come alone because they're trying to join parents who traveled earlier, who may be documented or undocumented, because they want to find work. Some children come because they've been trafficked, because somebody wants to exploit them. Some children come because they've heard that everybody gets jobs, the streets are lined with gold, and so they have a dream. So it's children who are affected by migration. The reason it's a useful category is because there's certain principles and certain important protections that apply to all children on the move. Whether you're seeking refugee status or whether you're trying to reunify with your family, you need to have certain things that you need to be protected from harm. You need to have access to education. 
You need to have access to healthcare. You need to be looked after by somebody who has your best interests at heart. These are basic principles that apply to any child. We live in a world in which there is a lot of migration of different sorts. For some groups of people, migration presents no problem at all. And for others, migration could be the beginning of a nightmare. People have always moved, and migration brings lots of possibilities. But of course, migration can also bring very severe risks. I tend to think of it really as a protection crisis. It's a crisis in the ability of societies and governments that have the capacity to extend humanitarian protection. And I think that's what really needs attention. One of the great things about the US is that any child, documented or undocumented, has a right to be in public school. And that's a wonderful protection that the Supreme Court decided on many years ago in a famous case when the Supreme Court said you can't punish children for things that parents might have done wrong. So if a parent brings in a child without documents and puts the child in school, it's not the child's fault. Secondly, it's not good for the country to have children who've never been educated. Do we want to have kids who can't read and write? Do we want to have kids who have never socialized with other children? No. So really, teachers don't need to worry about the child's legal status. They are right within their rights to treat every child equally. If you come in and you're seeking refugee status, you're seeking asylum, you are legally here while you're waiting for that status. It's just like somebody legally waiting in a queue to get into the cinema. You're not disturbing the peace. You're allowed to be here. International law and US law makes it quite clear there's nothing illegal about applying for refugee status. I think for teachers, it's important to include in the curriculum a range of different subject matters, not just on International Day or Newcomer Welcome Day, but as a general fabric of the education. So that it's not just the newly arrived children who are made to feel different, but the settled children see that part of their society are these new ingredients. My name is Michelle Green, and I'm the executive director for IRC in Wichita. A refugee is someone who has had to leave their country of origin for fear of persecution for any number of reasons. Conflict, political environment, religious beliefs. Essentially, for fear of their life, they've left their country and crossed an international border. There are 65 and a half million people who are displaced. That encompasses all displacement around the world. 22 and a half million of those are actually refugees. Since we've opened, we've resettled a little over a thousand refugees. We've seen a number of Congolese, South Sudanese, Somali, and Eritreans. That's the bulk of the population that we see. The IRC helps people who've been affected by conflict or disastrous crises to become self-sufficient again to regain control of their lives. My name is Marla Schmidt. I am the Field Office Director for Episcopal Migration Ministries Wichita. I've been here with this agency a little over four years. However, I've been involved with refugee resettlement off and on for the past 20 years. The average stay in a refugee camp is over 10 years. The actual security vetting process, if one is to come to the United States, is at the tail end of the process, and it takes anywhere from 18 to 36 months for someone to move through all of the different steps that are involved in that security screening. It involves many different federal partners, Homeland Security, United States Customs and Enforcement, the FBI, and there's a lot of cross-checking that's done through databases that these federal agencies have had for many, many years or decades. So there's the security screening that refugees have to go through to come to the United States, and then there's also a medical exam and a screening that has to happen as well. 
each of those clearances are only good for a certain amount of time and so everything has to line up the security screenings have to be in the green and the medical screenings in the green at the same time for every member in that household to be able then to have travel in that moment as the family gets off the plane they have no idea who is waiting for them they have no idea where their houses and where they'll be taken. So in that moment, they have to have complete trust. When we take them to their new apartment, we hand over the keys and we allow them to open the door and walk in first and experience um, the home that we've set up for them. Even as we drive from the airport to their house, they have questions as they're driving. When they pass downtown Wichita or see the lights of the city, they have questions about this new home. The following day, we do what we call a 24-hour home visit, and that's when everything really begins. There's a lot of documentation and paperwork and letting them know what's coming next. They will start by coming into the office every day for a few weeks, and during that time, we are conducting assessments, preparing family budgets and self-sufficiency plans. They have medical screenings. We take them to the grocery store and sort of teach them how to shop. I mean, it, it literally is that detailed. Within a couple of weeks of their arrival, they're generally enrolled in an employment program where they all receive job readiness training. Prior to that, they'll be doing what we call a cultural orientation. And that is just orienting them to laws, customs, cultures, all of these things. Our agency is interested with a small amount of money on a one-time basis to help spend on behalf of that individual or that family to meet their basic initial needs. Housing, food, furnishings, those type of items. Really the push of refugee resettlement is self-sufficiency and independence and that will be for the most part through gainful employment for the adults in the household. We're required within 30 days to have children enrolled in school. When they first arrive, we will go with them and make sure that the kids get registered. The communication, the initial discussion probably starts a week into their arrival. I think overall Wichita is a very good place to resettle folks. The cost of living here is reasonable. The unemployment rate is lower than the national average. But it is interesting, you know, one of the challenges we have is building the network of employers. There are a number of employers that we work with regularly who are very accommodating and willing to make that leap. And so we're always looking for new opportunities for clients. But one of the bigger challenges goes back to education. And it's finding ways to really get these kids up to speed in the American education system so that they are able to pursue higher education and better opportunities. We all want safety. We all want safety. And this is not their choice to be here. It's less than 1% of all refugees that ever get the chance at third country resettlement. There are so many misconceptions about refugees. I think one of the major ones that we regularly hear, are they legal? Refugees are documented. They're legal residents of this country when they arrive. The other thing is that people think it's going to be an economic strain. And initially there is a cost associated with a refugee arriving in this country. But these folks are also going to work almost inevitably within 120 days of arrival. And they're documented, they're paying taxes. So they're actually contributing to the economy in a much larger way than they're dreaming of. A typical stereotype is if someone doesn't speak English, they must not be smart or they might not be intelligent. And, and that's so wrong. When we have non-English speaking students come to North, you learn very quickly just in engaging them that they're very bright. They're energetic and they're enthused and they want to learn and they have a thirst for knowledge. They can be enrolled in AP. When they're enrolled in those courses, the language barrier is our challenge, not changing the curriculum to something that it shouldn't be. A smart kid who wants to learn physics will learn physics if you help minimize the barrier of the language. 
Refugees are not individuals who chose to be refugees. And many refugees, their ultimate goal is to return home. They want it to be safe so that they can go home. But unfortunately, many of the wars, many of the ethnic conflicts around the world are not ending and it's just not safe to go home. And so when that happens and when somebody is in a protracted state of limbo, that's then where refugees make a decision and place their name in the hat with United Nations High Commissioner to say, you know what, for me and my family, we are ready to consider being resettled to a third country. And they don't get to choose resettlement to America or resettlement to Canada. They choose to put their name in the hat for resettlement, and then it's those governments that make the decision which country moves forward. I think it's just because of their lack of language skills that people might think that they're not able to perform in a certain way when, yeah, these kids are really smart and they know a second language and you don't. <laughs> so, or a third language or a fourth language. So, yeah, you gotta give them the the benefit of the doubt that, that they're coming with a lot with them. I do occasionally get questions from citizens, sometimes asking how they get things when they're here. I think sometimes they think that everything is just a handout to the refugees. When somebody in the refugee program, they come over, they wanna start working right away. They wanna start living the American dream. There's a lot of times well before their limit is up, the refugees have already got one job, maybe two jobs, and their income's high enough that, you know, they're not getting the food stamps or anything else, and they're just supporting themselves. A lot of them show what America is supposed to be like, how hard you can work and live those dreams that are out there. I think some people still maybe have a misconception of what a refugee is when certain news things go on sometimes they wonder well are those the kind of people you're talking to are you talking to people that could be terrorists so i have to sit down and talk to them and explain to them that no here's how these refugees got here the refugees in themselves if anything they bring hard-working people that work at local businesses and help increase our economy and our livelihoods here i don't show that they have increased crime in any way in the areas they live in when kids come over and they're given that refugee's status, it's almost like a stigma. For the PE teachers, we did a rotation combined with all the refugee kids. And I was scared to death when it was my turn because I had no previous experience. I didn't really know what I would be running into as far as teaching them and instruction goes and then management as well. My advice for anybody that's working with refugees or any newcomer population the first thing would be don't be scared to try to learn the language. What goes in hand with that, don't be scared to mess up. The kids will let you know when you mess up, but they also appreciate you taking time to try to learn a little bit more about them and where they come from. So even hello, goodbye, I learned stop really quick in a lot of different languages because in this setting, stop is a very important thing for them to learn. But what people need to understand is they're human beings. They have needs and they need to be loved and they need to be helped and cared for just as much as you or I do. These kids are so worthy of good things and they deserve good things. A lot of the adults that I've met were professionals before war forced them to flee. But there's an assumption that they're, they're coming from huts and that they've never been to school and that they don't know how to care for themselves the way that we would expect. And a little bit of that may be misinterpreting the result of trauma as being a lack of ambition. The refugee adults that you meet are the strongest adults that you will ever meet in your life. They're absolutely the strongest. They are survivors. They're not here in order to make things harder for the rest of us. They're here for a place of safety and a place of education and a place where they can thrive. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wasco, principal of Curtis Middle School here in Wichita, Kansas, and this is my ninth year here. Curtis is a very diverse school. Within our student population, we have a significant portion of our newcomer students. 
students that are new to the United States. That has been a growing population. And initially it started just one or two, and then we started getting five and six and seven a week. Seven years ago, Curtis was named the lowest performing middle school in the state of Kansas. So not something we're proud of, but was something that we had to deal with. At that time, approximately 37% of our students were passing the state math assessment. It was painful, but it was probably the best thing that could ever happen for this school. Our adult literacy program was very important to us. One of the things I saw with our parents was they weren't always advocating for their kids. They didn't know how to advocate. They wouldn't call us because they didn't feel comfortable because someone there would not speak their language. And so part of this adult literacy class is to make sure that parents can speak for their kids. They know what they can expect at school. They know who they can call. It just created an environment for them to know that there is a safe place where they're invited to be and that they're valued. My name is Neil Mackey and I'm an adult literacy instructor. The goal of our program in part is to strengthen the local community but also to help parents connect with their kids' teachers and with their students. When a non-English speaker has to rely on their kid for so much uh, linguistically, when they have to rely on their kid to help them out at their parent-teacher conferences, there's a weird flip in the dynamic with parenthood and adulthood that could be kind of embarrassing for the adults. I was born in Sudan. I live in Egypt for 14 years, and that I moved in the uh, United States. We are happy, really, but when we come, something is broken that we don't speak English. I'm Sylvia Smith, an ESL teacher at Curtis Middle School. The program teaches them how to go around in the real world, you know? They need the language to work, to do their shopping, to go to the doctor's office. They are learning the vocab and the expressions that they need to communicate. When I came here in the United States, I used to live in Los Angeles. We don't need English because they speak Spanish. But then when I moved to Wichita, Kansas, I understand that I need to learn English, so that's why I decided to come to school. One of the issues that we had was consistency. The class needed to be every day, and it had to be at a time when they could come. There's some people who wanted nighttime classes, but we got to realize that there's some people who have night jobs who couldn't come at night, so they need to be available in the day. We actually have even had them through the summer when our building is closed. We do that because we know how much students lose over the summer, and parents who are emerging and learning this language really need to be continuing through over the summer so that we don't lose what we gain. In time, the program just continues to grow. It has now grown to include our refugee families. They need to learn English quickly. And one of the things I think that sets our program apart is it is taught like a real class. It has a lesson plan. They get a test back and they see that they're making growth or they don't and they ask for additional work from the teachers. It's truly a traditional classroom in my opinion. The kids, it's easier for them to pick it up so they might not necessarily see the challenge for their parents who've lived their entire lives in a different culture or speaking a different language. It's much more of a culture shock for them. When we come from Sudan, our English is not as strong, but when I joined the school, it's Already, I become perfect in English and how to communicate with other people in Wichita. Even when you are adults, he will help you how to work and how to communicate with other people and even how to help the children when they come from school, how to communicate with them. When you actually walk through the same school where your child's attending, it lets your child see you as a learner. It makes a difference. So I promise you, those children are more focused on school. They understand that their mom or dad is committed to learning, and they are excited about learning together. We could have them take adult literacy at one of our other buildings. 
We want them to take it here because I want them to be here with their children and it's good. This is a learning community, not just a place where middle school kids come with their teachers. The class is good and teacher is very, very nice. And my kids now speak good, good English. Yeah, if I need something, they can help me. No longer are we the lowest performing middle school in the state of Kansas. Within the first couple of years, we had double digit gains. And so we are very proud of that. I just want them to be like other children. They join the school without any problem. If they have a chance, they will go to college. These people are trying hard. They are upstanding citizens and they deserve respect and support as much as anybody. And it's really exciting to see the progress that they make over the course of a year. I used to tell people, can you read this for me? Because I didn't understand how to read. But now I don't have to tell people no more, can you read this? And I'm so glad for this school because uh, we really appreciate what they're doing. One of the things that has really been a challenge working with newcomers and refugee students, the curriculum that we have just wasn't cutting it. There was so much missing from these kids' education that we had to try and create ourselves to really meet their needs and to get them to skip up and you know, go from a second grade level up to a sixth grade level. That's been the most difficult thing is finding what they need getting it to them and making sure it works for them. So these services are important in valuing the culture that they bring to us and then helping them transition and understand our culture and language and our habits. It may be as short as just a few years, it may be a little bit longer depending on the age of the child, but they're extremely valuable services that we provide to kids and families. The newcomer program is designed for students who come from another country. It's their first time here in America. They are going to learn English for the first time. My job is to teach them English, but also get them familiar with how we do things here in America. You know, the culture is different. The way we respond to teachers, the way we uh, interact with each other is different. They start with the ABCs, letter names, letter sounds, and then we move to reading nonsense words and then sentences. And then we can start reading maybe short paragraphs using simple vocabulary. The newcomer program at Curtis Middle School is a large program. We have about 70 newcomers. And since the program has grown so much, we've had to break it down into a beginner newcomer group, the more advanced newcomer group. And then once they get out of the advanced newcomer class, we have ESOL 2 and ESOL 3, and they have an ESOL teacher for their language arts class, and then they're out for math, science, and social studies with the mainstream kiddos. So assessment done for an ESOL student, their first stop is the Multilingual Education Center. They give all the testing right down there, and then the scores are sent to us. Based on their scores, I'll know where to place them at, you know, between our four levels or if they're just ready for mainstream classes. We have such a variety of kids from so many different backgrounds. Some have been in school, some haven't. So we have to really um, modify and, and give them what they need. Sometimes we underestimate what they can do. We know what they are expecting in the regular class. We're trying to get them to that same spot. They're motivated to learn. You have to take advantage of that. Just never stop giving them because they are like sponges. It's a challenge. You got some kids that are really high language but low literacy. I think the way we address it at North High is to just maintain those high expectations. We cannot just feel sorry for them. 
but I think it's also planning lessons that directly address those gaps. Because if we don't fill them, they're just gonna graduate high school with those gaps, or they're never gonna overcome those gaps and they're gonna drop out. The reality is we cannot provide resources in every language of all of our students. They want to do better and to grow, but if they're not getting feedback, they can't do that. The teachers here can help me better by trying to understand what I'm going through. Just because I knew English when I came here, that doesn't mean that I understood everything that is there like saying. Because I have to process like what they're saying like three or four times. So to be better when they go slow. They have to understand that people from different countries, they have different culture. So I think if they talk to them more and more and be friendly with people from other countries, it will be very good. As a teacher, I put thought into it of how can I hold them accountable when they don't understand the language that I'm speaking. Things that I've done with that is let them pair up with each other. I don't make them not speak their own language if it helps them. For someone starting a newcomer program, a couple of things that I would have them really look at are the levels of your kids. But that's one of the big things with ESOL is you have this massive gamut of, of where kids are in your classroom. And being able to have a group of really beginners and have that curriculum that focuses on beginning, and then I have a group of more advanced newcomers that I can go a little deeper with. They can't just sit for 90 minutes you need to change it up for them. They need different experiences in learning and not just the regular sit in your chair, right on the worksheet. It's a whole person that we take. It's not just the academics, but it's the behaviors and the culture and things like that. Jina <laughs> Jacqueline. <laughs> My name is Erica Davis. I'm the COO of Martin Training and Staffing Solutions. We hire a wide variety of people from diverse backgrounds. We help them to gain gainful employment. And then while they're here, we promote from within. We offer training for members of the community. I think the training provides a smoother transition into full-time employment. You get to learn the English language a little bit more. You do interviewing skills. We do job coaching. You know, we provide that kind of support. When I came in, we are ramping up production in the summer and reached out to the International Rescue Committee. We offered employment to 15 refugees. Utoka Uganda. Minakuya na 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 UN hawa kunifanya vibaya wani karibisha vizuri wakani pachakura. We probably do have people on the floor from the refugee community who are able to do more than probably what they're doing right now, but that language barrier is so huge, you know, that it's difficult. Kipata kashukuru mungu. Lakini na asa hii, mina taka nisome kazi 
Mina, mina tamani sana kusudi ni juu English na mi, juu mina penda ni onge na bingi. Tuna penda ikazi, juu apa hakuna problema, apa ni fasi mzuri. Hakuna tunja, unabaki tu kunyumba, wakati unatoka kwa muganga, unaleta kartasi ya kopitari, unaipatia apa kukazi, hakuna tau, na hakuna shide nye. I think other companies should hire refugees or any other group that would come into the community because I think one, you provide an opportunity for people who probably would not have an opportunity and two, you're getting hard workers. You're getting people who are dedicated, who are committed, who you will not have the problem of calling out. I think you have people you can depend on and I think that's huge for any business. What did you think of pizza when you had it for the first time? Yeah, it was really good. Pizza. Asparagus, they look like little trees. Yes. <laughs> I'm Kim Daly. I've been in Wichita about 13 years and we love it here. So I met Blessing at church. I was asked to give her a ride because she didn't have transportation. And I guess I was a little confused with how somebody from the Congo had arrived in Wichita. That's just not an everyday thing. I learned very quickly that I was very ignorant to the fact that there are still wars going on in parts of Africa and that there were refugees still fleeing those countries. And so my family and I drove to her apartment and picked her up for church. And um, we just noticed something really special about her. She's very driven, she's a very hard worker. Hello, my name is Blessing. I'm originally from Congo, and I lived in Uganda for 12 years as a refugee before I came to America. And I've been living here for 25 months in Switchita. Kim is my best, best friend I met here. And I'm so thankful to God because she was the first person I met and want to know everything about me and help me a lot in any ways. Everything I know here, it's because of her and her family. It was God who planned it to be that way. The war, they were killing people every day. So we decided to flew from Congo to go anywhere life would take us. We ended up in Uganda. It was in 2004. At that time I was 15 years. My experience in Congo, it's really, really, really bad there. Every day they have been killing people and it's really, really hard. Yeah, uh, because just just imagining living with that fear every day. Even if now I'm here in America, but when I think when people who are living there, the fear, because living with fear, it, it's, it's really, really, really bad. Women are getting raped, children have been killed. I really feel pity for them. They call it the war of resources because in Eastern Congo, it's where there is many resources. Because that thing creates many group of rebels and they don't care about people's life. Going in Uganda, it was not easy, but at least being living a refugee in Uganda than living in Congo, where you live with fear of getting killed every day. Even if you don't have anything else, uh, but you have life. So we have been waiting all those 12 years until we get this blessing of coming to America. My first month here in Wichita, Kansas, it was strange. Americans fear strangers, that's how they grew up. But in Africa, it's different because you can just meet someone, shake hands, start stories. 
Americans smile, say hi, but they don't approach you because they don't get along with someone they don't know. And sometimes you fear people because it's new. So if people approach us, it will help us feel like home. I wish more people would understand how similar we are to refugees. At the core, we're people. They're the same as we are. And to just get to know them, ask questions. They overcame a lot of obstacles to make it out of their situation and a lot of patience and to get to this country. And here they are starting all over again. I'm so happy to be in America. Yeah, it's a dream come true. I've been waiting for 12 years. I'm so blessed to be here. And all the people I've met here, I'm really grateful to God, that's a blessing. I think when a child has had a very traumatic or difficult set of experiences, the first step is for any adult who encounters them to be conscious of that, to be aware of potential red flags. What it might mean is that you don't start off by asking the toughest questions. So I know in my experience as a refugee lawyer, I would never start an interview by saying to somebody, please tell me how you escaped from your home. I would never start with that. I'd start with questions about where are you living now? Which are your favorite subjects? Which are the people you're closest to? How many brothers and sisters do you have? Easy questions. And then you would gradually move and you'd be guided by the child. But to expect someone to trust you with very difficult information early on when you're just building a relationship is a mistake. This obligation of basic humanity extends to thinking about these children as our own children. So if we have a child of our own who's in distress, you wouldn't just get what you needed out of them and then turn away. It's a balance between establishing a warm and trusting relationship, which you do through ordinary conversation and treating the child like any other child, and then gradually creating space for a more deep and potentially painful conversation. Sometimes it takes children a long time to want to talk about the most painful things. My first refugee kid was last year and she was terrified of school. She would kick and scream and try to run out every single day. I just think that she didn't know that it was a safe place and I wasn't able to communicate with her. I just kept hugging her and just saying it's okay and smiling. And then one day she was happy to be here and she worked, but it took about three months for her to feel safe here. Where she came from, it was so traumatic. So I just kind of let her lead the way. And then before you knew it, she joined in like everyone else. I think we have to listen to them. One student, he will talk about how his dad was killed. And it was hard, and his behavior was showing, you know, some aggressiveness. So we just listen, have an open heart, and say, you know, I'm so sorry that that happened. And let him talk, because they need to talk. If they're sharing something that is a little disturbing for others, then we can call them on the side and kind of listen to them. But for the most part, we're open and we share. At that time, we were having a person that was coming and doing crafts and things like that and kind of letting them talk about their problems through journaling or making a bracelet, you know, a bracelet with somebody that you love and you left in your country. Art is about emotion and art is a visual language. So students will come in the art room after maybe having had a frustrating day at school or maybe they had a frustrating night at home. And children will come into the art room and they'll just release that emotion into the artwork they make. And we don't think of school art teachers as being art therapists, but we are. When I taught in Uganda, I had children who were forced migrants from a variety of reasons. I don't really think I fully realized that these children had so much loss and grief 
Children aren't creating the problems they have to deal with. Adults are. And children aren't the ones deciding. I want to get up and move three countries away and seek asylum. In the United States, sometimes what we perceive as difficulties pale in comparison to what some children around the world are dealing with. I never thought this day would come because I've been through four high schools. And each time I move to another country, I have to repeat the grade, so I'm very excited. When I was in South Africa, I just thought about graduating, not going to college, because they were not going to accept me as a college student there. After graduation, I'm planning to go to WATC for architecture maybe as a program or undergraduate classes, and then transfer to K-State. With my degree, I plan to go back to Congo and remodel old houses, maybe. I can't wait. I'm feeling excited because graduation is a big thing. After graduation, I'm gonna stay here in Wichita because I'm gonna be working, so I will stay. The job I have here is composite mechanic. I run there uh, at uh, Wichita Area Technical College, and uh, it was composite. You have to use the Kevlar, carbon fiber, and the fiberglass. In five years, because I, I took composite uh, classes, so I want to learn more about it. And uh, I hope to go to a college or university so that I can get my education level higher than I have today. New teachers working with refugees have a tremendous opportunity. They have an opportunity to really be a change maker in somebody's life. So often when you talk to young people who have been forced to flee home and have had to leave so much behind and you ask them about how they got to where they got to, they will mention a special teacher as being transformative in their life. Having children who have an extra need for attention is, of course, an added responsibility, but I think the silver lining is they could have this tremendously transformative impact. You look at the world a little differently when you have newcomer students they kind of open your eyes to something you've never seen before. They give you little glimpses of their life and their culture, and it makes you want to know more. They've made a big difference in who I am as a person and as a teacher. For classroom teachers, my best advice is just don't make assumptions, ask. You can plan activities that activate their prior knowledge, activate their prior experiences, and then give them the opportunity to share that in a safe way. I guess I focus more on how we are the same instead of different. It's because I want to treat them with dignity. They're a real high school student. Knowing that it makes a difference, being able to see that in the lives of kids, also starting to see some of the refugees giving back has been a wonderful experience. Part of what keeps me going and, and drives me to get up and, and come in and do what I do is I know there's so much more that could be done. Teachers play a really significant role because students are with them each day. I think that for teachers it's just really important that they understand where these children are coming from, that these kids are highly motivated, they value school, 
a lot of them have not had the opportunity to have the kind of schooling that we provide here. As we think about refugees and kids that come to this country, and what teachers need to know is, I can advocate at any given time for what their needs are. All of us got into this profession to change the life of a kid. What other profession gets the opportunity to change the life of a kid? It's so valuable. If anybody has an opportunity to work with them, I would recommend it because you will, you will walk away with much more than you've ever given. These kids are so worthy of good things and they deserve good things. And they might never see mom or they might never see dad or brothers and sisters again in their lives, but here they are in the United States and they are working their tails off to make themselves better people. I know it's hard like to learn another language and take all classes in the language that you don't speak, but they have to keep pushing. My advice for them is keep practicing, doing their homeworks and attend to school every day. Yeah, that will be good. They can graduate too. And all the students from Africa and all over the world that they are refugees, here in America, there's a great opportunity, so take it with both hands. And remember, don't give up. These kids deserve the best in the entire world. They deserve every chance that every other kid in the United States gets.